So we'll start it off. Chapter 3 is pretty much looking at matter and what is matter and all that kind of fun stuff. So when we're looking at matter and science in general, typically our observations get categorized into two sections, qualitative and quantitative observations. So we've got a fun little sheep here, or a U. Okay. Let's make some qualitative and quantitative observations. So what's a general observation that we can make of this? Image. Any ideas? The image. <laughs> really nothing? I think it's a sheep. That's a legitimate observation. We got a sheep. Okay. Um, so the animal that we're observing is a sheep. Is this qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative. What else could we observe? What's that? It's white. That might be debatable, but we'll come back to that. The size. Huh? Size. We could make a statement about the size of the sheep. What's your observation? OK. So we could go small, large, something like that. But also classify that as qualitative. Do we have any quantitative observations we could try and make? There's actually another one in back. I was going to say one initially as well. So we actually have two. So we could or quantitate this, how many things are in there. We can start to bring in numbers associated with this. With that size, could we bring in a number with that as well? Might be a little bit harder to do at this point. What we could do is take the sheep and weigh it, and we could get the weight of the sheep. I have no idea on scale. Anybody know anything about weights of sheep? What's the general weight of a sheep? For that one, probably closer to 100. 100 pounds? Okay, there we go. We got a 100-pound sheep. All right. So what is the difference between qualitative and quantitative? Yeah. Our quantitative is looking at a general number, or not even a general number, a specific number of something. We're trying to quantify it, associate a number with it. Qualitative is kind of this general observation, okay? which could bring us back to some of those arguments. When we look at quantitative, those are pretty steadfast and solid. There are two. Okay? The only argument we could really have on that is, oh, I didn't see the other sheep hiding behind that first one. Okay? There isn't really anything we can disagree with there. When it comes to sheep, qualitative observation, yeah, we'll probably all agree that those are sheep. There isn't a whole lot of variance in that. But as far as the color of the sheep, is that really white? Well, it's kind of off-white, maybe bone-colored to me. Or maybe that's eggshell. Okay. Our qualitative observations tend to have a little bit of variance within them because they come down to a personal perception of that, where the quantitative tends to be, this instrument says this. Okay. So our instruments we tend to put a little bit more weight behind and actually specify those numbers. So when we move into lab, almost everybody nails the quantitative observations because the instrument told me that that sheep was 100 pounds. Okay. But the very rare ones that most students tend to miss would be all the qualitative ones because in four hours from now, you'll probably remember that that was still an off-white sheep. And you think, well, I'll never forget that. That's not a big deal. I don't need to make that observation. How about four years from now? Okay. That's a little bit more questionable. So when we're going through and doing science, we need to make both the qualitative and the quantitative observations because both of those can lead us uh, to correct or wrong answers depending on how we manipulate them or how we forget them. Okay. So let's take a look at some qualitative uh, observations. 70, 80 percent of the composition of life. What is it? What makes up 70, 80 percent of all life as we know it? Water. Water is an interesting substance. It's our general solvent. It allows us to do everything. It also has uh, a nifty little feature that's slightly different than most other, we'll stick with compounds or even elements. Uh, that we know of. What's that special feature? Do 
we have different types of matter or different phases? Yeah, what are those phases? Solid, liquid, and gas. What's special about water? Or we can see it in both the liquid state, the solid state, and we can vaguely see it in the gas state. Okay, so water's kind of an interesting example to work with. If we get cold enough, we can see snow, which is solid water. <coughs> As we warm up, we can see liquid water. As we warm it up even further, we can get into the gas state. We now have gaseous water. So we now have these three phases that we want to make some kind of observations about so that we can draw conclusions to potentially other types of phases. Okay, the general trends that we would jump with these are your shape, your volume, and your compressibility. Okay, so these work for each of these types of phases. So we could start with our solids. Can you tell me about the shape? That's something that's going to change very often. We have a desk. Does its shape all of a sudden change on you? No. So the shape of a solid tends to be fixed. It's not going to change on you. What about its volume? Okay, is the volume of a solid really going to change much? Nope. Your volume is also <coughs> fixed. Which then takes us to the next part, our compressibility. Well, if the volume can't change much, what's going to happen to our ability to compress it? We can't really compress it. So we're going to have virtually no compressibility. Uh, I'm not sure how to write that. Let's just say not not compressible. What happens when we move to the liquid state? The shape can change. Think about water. You put it into one bottle or you could pour it out and it's going to spread over that area. Okay? So the shape will change. Okay? Or as your textbook likes to call it, variable. What about the volume? That's going to stay constant okay, within a reasonable situation. So we're looking at a fixed volume. Well, if we fix the volume, what happens to the compressibility? Volume can't change. We can't compress it. Okay? So we're, we're still, for lack of a word, oh, I should stick with the not, right? So not really compressible. What happens when we move to the gas? What happens with our shape? That's going to change. Okay. Depending on what container is holding the gas, we're going to change the shape of the overall thing. So our shape is extremely variable. What about the volume? It's also going to be variable. As I change the shape, I could potentially change the volume. Well, the gas is going to fill that volume, okay? So that's also variable. Well, if the volume is variable, what does that mean about our compressibility? What was that word? Someone give me a good word to use. Variable? Sure, let's stick with variable. Okay, so our compress compressibility can also change. So as a piece of matter, water is a nice species to work with because we could make observations about each of these types or phases of matter really quickly and easily that we couldn't do with other substances, okay, or at least substances that were readily available. So if we look at initial science and where we started, water's probably where everything picked up from. Okay, and then we try to see how water could interact with different species. Okay. So matter can be broken down into a couple different <coughs> systems. Matter is composed of our solids, liquids, and gases. Okay, so I would kind of put that still in the matter box. Solids, our liquids, and our gases. Is that how you spell gases? How many yeah. S's are in gases? Yeah? Okay. It's the British spelling is with three S's. Matter can be split down into two separate categories. We can look at mixtures or we can look at pure substances. Okay, and this can become a bit difficult to separate, okay, at least initially. 
Okay, once we've got those two categories, they then separate out into more categories. So we can have a mixture that is heterogeneous, meaning uneven is how I would describe that. Okay, so you're heterogeneous, you've got things kind of inconsistent throughout the sample. Or a homogeneous system, it's consistent. That whole mixture is exactly the same. Okay, if I grab any one section of that, I would expect it to be the exact same as any other. So examples I could come up with with that. Let's take water, because water is a nice example to work with, and we'll take a couple beakers. And water is always blue, right? So let's throw in some water. <clears throat> now what I want to do is add to this. Okay. In one case, in the heterogeneous mixture, I want to make sure that it doesn't mix evenly, that I get some kind of unfair uh, equation within this. Okay. In the homogeneous, I want it to mix completely evenly. So what might I add to either one of those? Okay. Oh, that's an interesting one. I didn't think of that one. We could go through and add oil to which one? We could add it to the heterogeneous depending on our perspectives of oil, we may change the color. All right, and when we add the oil to it, we try and shake it up, do those two mix. Okay. They might mix a little bit. Look at salad dressing. Okay, but does it ever end up as a homogeneous mixture? Okay, no, because at any point I can reach in and grab just an oil droplet. So even when we get into that salad dressing situation, <coughs> what we have is an emulsification. We just took the oil layer and the water layer and I broke them up into smaller pieces and then put those smaller pieces near each other. But those smaller pieces never get down to the molecular level. Okay, we're looking at just smaller groups of those molecules all trying to avoid each other. Okay. So oil could work. The one that I was thinking of was sand. We put sand in there, what happened? It falls to the bottom. I can shake it up and that sand starts to float around in it, but then eventually what happens? It all settles out. Okay? And if I reach in and grab, I'm going to grab at the bottom pretty much pure sand. If I grab at the top, I'm grabbing pretty much pure water. So we end up with a heterogeneous mixture. There's a difference in the phases between these. The easiest ones are when we have liquid versus uh, a different phase. So liquid versus solid, liquid versus gas. Right. <clears throat> or in the oil example, we had a trickier one because it was liquid versus liquid. Okay. What about the homogeneous example? We could add salt. Uh, let's not stick with formulas yet. So we could add salt into this. But salt's a solid. <coughs> Why is that a homogeneous mixture? The salt dissolves in the water and evenly disperses throughout it. Okay. So what ends up happening is what we end up with is, we could argue, a new phase in the case of this homogeneous system. Okay. That new phase is now a mixture of a solid and a liquid that have evenly intercalated and dispersed within it. And what we now have is what I would call A solution, okay, where we now have a mixture of these two things. Okay, how is this different from our pure substance? Okay, well, our pure substance separates down into compounds and elements. Okay, what's an example of a compound in the examples we've been looking at so far? Water is a compound. Still don't want to write out the formula yet. I'm trying to make that a surprise. Thank you for laughing at that. We could take a look at our water as a pure compound. As long as we don't add anything else into it, it's just water. Well, how is that different from our salt solution that was a homogeneous mixture? Because if we look at them, they look exactly the same. Why is the one with just pure water 
an example of a pure substance compound and not a homogeneous mixture. In the case with our salt, we aren't connecting the water to the molecules of salt. Okay? They are still separated. Okay? We aren't forming a formal bond between them. Without that formal bond or that connection between them, we're looking at a mixture. Only once we link the individual components that make up each of our compounds with a formal bond, only then can we look at it being a compound. Okay? What makes up water? Big reveal. We've got hydrogen. Okay, I can write a little bit cleaner than that. Let me try that again. We've got hydrogen, and we have oxygen. Okay, if we were somehow able to disconnect the molecule that made up water and get those to separate out into their individual components, we could end up with a container of hydrogen and a container of oxygen. Once we've now separated those away from each other, we now have pure elements. Okay, well, what is an element? Pointing at the periodic table of elements is helpful. <laughs> All of those are our elements. Okay? And where those were kind of originated from was that way back when we went through and we tried to compose different molecules and come up with different compounds out of it. And they tried breaking those compounds up into smaller and smaller pieces. And what they decided was that the elements were the smallest possible combination, okay? or the smallest origin that we could go through and have. Are they the smallest possible piece? No, we actually have what are known as subatomic particles, which we'll also talk about, that make up each of our individual elements. But the elements are of consistent subatomic particles to make these. So we could almost look at our periodic table of elements as compounds of the subatomic particles. Okay? But those compounds always, quote unquote, compounds always come together in very specific ratios of those subatomic particles to make our elements. Once we have the elements, those can now react with each other to make us compounds. So the compounds are just a mixture of our elements okay, that have been physically connected to each other. Okay? So we could look at our periodic table. Everybody almost always panics about this when it comes to periodic tables. We've got the version I downloaded had a few less than the ones we've got up on our walls, 118 different elements. 118 elements, we're talking about chemistry, a new language. When you learn a new language, what do you need to learn? The alphabet. Okay, how does it get put together? So we all, well, we, I think we all speak English and probably some other languages, and we all had to memorize an alphabet. Okay, how many letters did our alphabet have? That's a bad question because I don't know the answer. 26? 26, 26 uh, letters in our alphabet. Okay. took us a while to memorize that, but we went through probably several years learning our alphabet and figuring out all the letters. Okay. In 16 weeks, we're giving you 118. Ouch. How many of those 118 should you actually memorize? Okay. Depending on the courses, I've definitely talked to people that have had instructors insist that you had to memorize all 118. I feel really bad for those students. Okay. If you go ahead and go check out Canvas, I believe that organizing still works. Under Files, and then there's a Helpful Files folder, you'll find this file name called Elements for Memorization or Elements for Memory. Within that file, we've drastically condensed the, now, the amount of elements that you need to have memorized. Instead of it being 118, it's 30-ish, I think. Okay. Why would we cut out so many different elements. They're not common. We could make an argument for common versus not common. Uh, what's your definition of common, though? I mean, like, found easily? Like 
So I would argue it's not going to be a found easily, but that's not a bad idea. We're not going to use them. <laughs> okay? So the other 118 minus 30, okay, we just don't typically see in the lab. We won't talk about them in the lecture, so we really don't want to force you to go through and memorize them. Okay? As you work through more and more advanced chemistries, you end up seeing more and more of those elements and trying to use them. Okay? And if you're going to have to work with them, what do you need to do? Memorize the name and symbol so you can accurately talk about that uh, with your cohort of people. Okay? So when you go through and look at the periodic table, try to not panic too much, but start working on that memorization process. Okay? Nailing down the element name and the element symbol. All right, there's a lot of other information on the periodic table, a lot of different numbers. Do we expect you to ever memorize those? Some yeses, some noes, some oh god, I hope no. Okay. For the most part, no, we don't expect you to memorize those. Okay. You will probably, through your coursework, end up memorizing some of them. Why? Because you use it again and again and again. So my favorite subject, and this is one of the reasons why it's my favorite subject, is organic chemistry. Periodic table started at 118. General chemistry, we make you memorize 30. How many do we need in organic? 118? It's about 10. <laughs> we narrow it down a lot, mainly because organic chemists are kind of messed up in the head, okay, potentially because of all the drugs they've been making. <laughs> and beyond that, uh, can't really deal with numbers all that well. And we have roughly 10 fingers, most of them at least. Okay. That's about as high as we can count. So when we deal with organic chemistry, we drastically simplify the periodic table even further. We do expect a little bit more information in return for that loss of elements, but for the most part, we stick at 10. Okay. So that's my pitch for organic chemistry. It's easier in Gen Chem because it's only 10 out. <coughs> So, dealing with the periodic table, any of these that you think would be more likely to have memorized? Probably the first 20 to 30 are going to be really high on that list of memorization. Okay? Organic chemistry really focuses, because I've got those actually memorized, we got hydrogen, go figure carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, your halogens, and then occasionally boron and aluminum. Did I count right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Look at that. Okay. Do other elements show up? Yeah, of course. Sulfur pops up in every so often. So does phosphorus. Okay. That's pretty much it as far as organic chemistry. Because I'm an organic chemist, which of these elements on this 118 do you think I'm really going to expect you to know? Those 10, okay, or 12, okay? So those should absolutely be committed to memory. The other ones that I will try and make you memorize happen to be ones that students commonly miss, okay? And that's because when we look at the periodic table and we come up with the names, sometimes the names correlate with the symbol and sometimes not. So for instance, that very first element, H, is hydrogen. hydrogen. Well, where did the H symbol come from? Hydrogen starts with H. Okay, so that makes sense. How about the next symbol? Helium. Where does H-E come from? First two letters. Okay, so that tends to kind of make sense. So let's pick a couple more examples. Let's take a look at N, element number 7. What's the name of that one? Nitrogen. Where would the N come from? First letter, N, nitrogen. Interesting. How do you spell nickel? Ooh, crap. That looks like nickel. I don't think that's right. Okay. Both nickel and nitrogen start with the first two letters being the same. These are very commonly confused between students. 
Okay? Because they are very commonly confused and they're both within the first 30, guess what? Both of these tend to show up all over tests throughout general chemistry. Okay? Organic chemists don't care because nickel's not on our list to memorize, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay? So be aware of some of these kind of extra caveats that can mess with you. The other one that's fun, that tends to show up a lot, why can't I find it? Well, here, maybe we can help you find it. Tungsten. Where's tungsten? Why can't I find it? Is it T? Thank you for the 74. It's W. What? Tungsten absolutely does not begin with W. Except I spelled it wrong. There's a silent W in front. No, just kidding. <laughs> Okay. So why the different symbol? Okay. We're in America and we think everything's based off of English. Fortunately, chemistry was a very old subject. Most of these elements were named and lettered based on their origin language, which happened to be typically German or Latin. Okay. So a lot of the names that pop up in here you won't see match the symbol. Another common one, which you guys, well, two of them that you might remember, about AG and AU. Silver and, gold. Silver and gold. Again, we don't have any overlaps there. Okay, Where's that overlap coming from? It's I'm pretty sure Latin for both of those. I don't remember where the origin is for silver. But gold is aura, aurora, aurora. think. Okay. So it's coming back from those Latin roots. So if anybody studied Latin, oh, bummer. Okay. German? No Germans either. Okay. So that's now an entirely new language for all 30 of those elements. Okay. How are you going to learn that language? Practice. Okay. The elements for memory, file, you'll notice some of those elements are bolded. Those bolded elements are the ones that I look at and say, I've seen that show up on a test before. Or that element is really important. You need to know what that one is. So the bolded ones are kind of bare minimum, nail the bolded ones down. Everything else, okay, you should still have memorized. It will show up some point at some time, but with a much lower probability. Okay? Questions? You want to worry about the numbers yet? Is that a yes or a no? Ooh, we got a yes in there, really? Okay, we won't worry about the numbers quite yet. We want to look at a little bit more of what made up the elements, our subatomic particles, but that's for a future lecture. Okay, so what we're going to do is just kind of say that those are our elements and look at some of the subclassifications that can come off of our periodic table. Okay. We have three categories that fall out of our periodic table. Metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Okay. We've got a list on the left and right following underneath us. Okay. Which of these two, or these two lists belong to which of those categories? Metals, nonmetals, metalloids. We can say left and right. What's the left list belong to? Metals. Why do you say metals? Okay. Luster is a pretty big one. Okay. Where I would go with it is the conduction of electricity. What do we put in our walls? Some people then steal out of the walls. Okay. Our copper wire. Where's copper on our periodic table? Whoops, I don't have that in front of me. How do you spell copper? C-O-P-P-E-R. Which element is it? CU. It's again one of those ones that's spelled differently. Okay. So copper CU is a metal. Okay. What's another metal for an example? Any metal. What's that? Gold. Gold's a metal. Where's gold on the periodic table? Okay. 79. Kind of boring because it's right underneath copper. But that works. Any other metals? Iron, where's iron? 
Fe. Any other metals? Titanium. Titanium. Okay. Zinc. Anybody notice any patterns where these metals are popping up? They're all on the left side of the periodic table. Okay. It would be helpful if there was some magic line that could allow us to distinguish these. Hmm. Well, before we can find that line, let's take a look at some of the nonmetals. Okay. Our nonmetals are mostly solids or gases. Okay. And we change some of those physical properties. They're dull, brittle, don't conduct electricity. Okay, low densities. Why might they have a low density? Meaning the mass to volume ratio is much lower. It's compressible because they're gases. Okay. So what's a nonmetal? Mercury is an interesting one. Where is mercury on the periodic table? Good spelling. HG, there's a silent HG in front of the M in mercury. Okay. Metal or non-metal? It's actually a metal. Okay. And that is kind of a tricky one. One thing that we could do is with our copper and our gold, gold is right underneath copper. So if copper is a metal, we might predict that someone in theory, had some intelligence in designing this periodic table, would say that maybe what's underneath it is similar to it. We said zinc was a metal. Where's mercury? One underneath it. Very similar chemistry. They both are actually metals. Mercury is especially different because what phase is mercury? It's a liquid. So our periodic table adds some extra, in extra information into this. What color was zinc? Black. Black. What color was gold? Black. Iron. Black. Okay. What color is mercury? Blue. Blue. What is that color representing? Liquids. It's a phase change. The black on our periodic table represents solids. Okay. At room temperature. The blue represents liquids. All right, so mercury is a fun one because we go through and look at our list of metals and we say right there at the top it's got to be solid. Does it say it has to be solid? No, it actually says most of them are solids. And I don't know what the percentage is, but it's really, really high. It's like 99% of them are solids. The one exception, mercury. Mercury is a liquid. It's the only one that's a liquid as far as our metals go. All right. So non-metals. Still looking for a non-metal example. Oxygen. Oxygen. What we breathe in. That's a gas. It's absolutely not a solid at room temperature. That could be very awkward for us. Okay, where's oxygen on our periodic table? It's number eight, upper right-hand side. We're looking at the letter O. What other elements are non-metals? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Way to throw in the curveball. Oh, hydrogen's way the freak over here. That's where we said our metals were. That's a bit odd. Okay, we'll come back to hydrogen, similar to mercury in that case. What other non-metals do we have? Helium. Helium. What else? Oxygen. Oxygen we got? Fluorine. Fluorine. Argon. Argon. R A R. Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Krypton. Lithium is not a non-metal. Lithium is actually a metal. Carbon, non-metal. Okay. Think about after a fire, what's left in the fire? Charcoal. What makes up charcoal? Carbon. Okay. Is that nice, bright, and shiny? Okay. As long as all that was was fire and not anything else, it probably just looks dull and black. Okay, so carbon's a nonmetal. So where were the bulk of our nonmetals? On the right hand side. Okay. But what's going to happen is we move from the right to the left. We're at nonmetals and we slowly move towards metals. Uh oh. 
what's going to happen when we transition between metals and nonmetals? We end up somewhere in between with some weird crossover characteristics between both classes, and we have the metalloids. Where is that crossover? You look really, really carefully at our periodic table, there's a nice solid or darker bolded black line running a diagonal through that rightmost box. That diagonal is the division between metals and nonmetals. Most elements that fall on that line are, are metalloids. Okay? Not all of them, but most of them. Okay? Our tech or our image here doesn't have the best characteristics of that, but if you take a look at your textbook, I'm pretty sure, yeah. The textbook has uh, in the cover periodic table. Thank you. And you'll notice they've colored it slightly differently. They've got, what is it, purple, green, and yellow. The purple were all on the right hand side of the periodic table, and those are all metals. All the ones on, did I say that right? Left-hand side? I don't remember which side it was. Left-hand side. Right-hand side. Those were colored yellow. Those are all non-metals. What's green running down that diagonal? The semi-metals or metalloids. Okay, that cross over between that. Is that line perfect? No. Okay, because someone was nice enough to suggest it. Where's our one weird exception? Okay. Aluminum falls on that line, but I would argue that's still kind of in a gray area between our metalloids and metals and nonmetals. So we can kind of let that one slide. Where's hydrogen? Way in the left. Way on the left hand side, which is absolutely supposed to be a metal. But it's absolutely not a metal. Okay, it's a gas. So we do run into an issue on where hydrogen is located on the periodic table. Depending on what table is being used, the hydrogen may be located in that first column, or you may see it located all the way in that second to last column right next to helium. Okay. Why might we change its location? Maybe there's something about the chemistry of this column that hydrogen is similar to in that first column. Turns out there is. Something about all of the elements in that column, their, react, their reactivity is very, very similar, and hydrogen kind of mimics that. Unfortunately, it doesn't really fit in that column. But if we put hydrogen over in that second to last column, okay, we can change its character a little bit, and it now closer mimics the nonmetals. It's belonging in the correct category. And a different reactive state of hydrogen can also make it look like everything in that second to less column as well. So how do we decide where to put the hydrogen? Personal preference. The standard notation has been to put hydrogen in the first column. Most periodic tables put them there. Sometimes you'll see it over in that second to last one. Okay? So hydrogen's our floating exception of a nonmetal. Let's go back to our periodic table that we've got up on our walls. We have identified what the color black was. What was that? It was, most of them are metals, but if we look at carbon, carbon's not a metal. So black does not mean metal, it means solids. What does blue mean? Liquid. Mercury was blue. Is there another element that's blue? Bromine. We look back up at my list. I've again said most are solids or gases. We do technically have liquids in both categories. Bromine is a liquid. How many other liquids are on the uh, elemental states at room temperature? None. It's just those two. Okay. Again, another popular question to ask. Which of the following are liquids at room temperature? Okay. We've come up with a list. Bromine and mercury are the only ones that are liquids at room temperature. What's the last color mean? Our red color? Gases. That could be a lot of work to go through and memorize. That's the bottom. A little key that tells you what each of those colors mean. That's kind of nice. Okay. Is there yet another color, actually, or lack of color? You could look at the clear or white or just outlined symbol. Okay. 
You'll notice all of those show up at the very bottom of our periodic table. Okay, very, very high numbers. What does that clear or white color represent? So if those of you really close to the periodic table can actually read it off. They're synthetically prepared. Okay, meaning they are so large, so massive, that that element actually falls apart on its own. So the only way that we can actually find that element is if we, as humans, make it. Okay? So we go into the lab and we smash atoms together and we hope that we can make one of those elements. Okay? For them to actually make it to the periodic table, they have to exist for a certain amount of time. Anybody know what that time is? Let's just randomly call it five seconds. I actually don't know either. Okay? So they have to exist for a certain amount of time to actually be classified as a legitimate element on our periodic table. Why do we not have more elements on this? <clears throat> okay, we could make the argument that we haven't discovered them. Okay, that's legitimate. We can still potentially smash atoms together and add more uh, comp composition together. How many people on this planet are over nine feet? Humans. Not very many. Why? humans physically able to grow that big? No. Why not? Because we start to have issues with our bone structure. Look back to Andre the Giant. We can have gigantism genes. People can actually grow larger and larger until eventually they grow so large that our organs actually fail because they can't deal with that size. Effectively the same thing's happening with our elements. They get so big that that structure is so unstable it immediately falls apart. So could we potentially still put some more and more stuff on there? Yeah. But we're starting to reach a threshold of where that element can't get any bigger. Okay, so we're starting, in theory, reaching a point where we're kind of done with all the elements. Where do all of these elements exist? In our universe. Okay, everything in our universe is composed of these individual elements. So that's kind of neat. We can take this periodic table, and it works everywhere that we could possibly ever visit. Okay. So, go through and look at some pretty colors. Look at these pictures. What do you think we've got? Metals, non-metals. What do you think those are images of? A metal or a non-metal? Anybody recognize any of them? Glow stick. We got the glow stick in the middle. It's not quite a glow stick, but it's pretty close. Okay. What we've got there is, I actually forgot when I put the image together, one of the noble gases might be krypton. Right. Anybody recognize anything else? No one recognizes that last one at all? Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. What we're looking at is a carbon structure. Middle one here, that, what phase does that look like? A liquid. What color was mercury? Silver. If this is not silver, bromine. There we go. Also a non-metal. But we've got a list up here as non-metals. I would do that first one, except I don't remember which non-metal that was. Okay. How about these? Metals and non-metals. Uh, I'm being a tricky jerk. All of those are semi-metals. Okay, or are metalloids. Okay. How would you know by looking at them? Probably wouldn't, which is why I also don't know what the elements are. Okay? What we're looking at within these, or to decide our metalloids, whether they were metals or non-metals, is we're pretty much going to have to go through and test each of these categories. Okay? Yes, they're both solids, but we get that in both metals and non-metals. Okay? Luster. Okay? Our metals are kind of shiny, our non-metals are dull. Those look kind of shiny. We could look at malleable versus brittle. How are we going to test that with a picture? Can't. What we're really looking at for that is hitting it with a hammer. Does it deform or does it just shatter? Okay. Until we can actually test that, it's going to make it a little bit more difficult to classify these images based on what those elements are. Okay. So as far as trying to understand what's going on between these, the metals and the non-metals, you should be looking at those and trying to decide key ones that allow you to differentiate between your different elements. OK, 
okay, your classes, your metals versus your nonmetals. When it comes to the metalloids, what are the odds that we'll ask you physical properties or give you some classifications and expect you to identify that it's a metalloid? Pretty questionable considering our metalloids bounce back and forth between our metals classifications and our nonmetals classifications. Make sense? Okay. So, no questions about our elements for the moment? Okay, I can tell by all your frantic writing, you've been excited. Physical laws. So, we've got a couple big laws that show up in Chapter 3. We've got the conservation of mass. This goes back to a scientist, Antoine Lavoisier. Anyone speak French? Good, so I pronounced that right. <laughs> Found that the mass of reactants before a chemical change was always equal to the mass after a chemical change. Okay. which is kind of an interesting observation. What he's saying is that we can't destroy matter. We can't destroy any kind of mass. We can convert it from one thing to another, but we can't ever destroy it. Okay. And that comes in as our law of conservation of mass. We've got a couple examples of reactions here. We can take hydrogen and we can take oxygen. Okay. When you think hydrogen, what do you think? Heavy, light. Really light, gas floating all over the place, right? No real weight. Take oxygen. What do you think? It's oxygen. Still also a gas. Think real light. We react those two together, and all of a sudden we have water. And what do we think of when we think of water? Heavy. Heavy. How is that possible? Hydrogen and oxygen are light. Water is heavy. What happened to our mass? We had a whole lot of that really light species and a whole lot of that really light species. And when we put those whole lot of things together, we can condense them into water to give us our mass. So for equal volumes, we're going to see a very small mass of water come out of this. But if we go through and do equal masses, right, the mass will be the same on both sides. Right? So don't look at volume, look at the mass. The other thing we could do, take wood and we burn it with oxygen. Throw a, what is it, a log? <laughs> a log of wood into a fire and we burn that. What happens to the mass of the wood? Decreases. Decreases. So we go, oh, this law must be crap, okay? Because the mass decreased. Where did that mass go? into a gas, are we measuring the mass of that gas as it, the mass of our wood decreases? No. This is where gases become tricky. They disappear, and we tend to ignore that weight because they tend to have a very small weight within a given volume. Ignore the volume, focus on the mass. If we could trap all of that gas, the weight does become equal. Other random thought, in that combustion we generate water. What happens when you throw water on a fire? It puts out the fire. So how can we possibly run a combustion reaction where we generate water? Wouldn't that put out the fire? There's enough heat released in this reaction, really, when you burn something, it gets really, really hot, that what happens to the water? It evaporates. In the gas state, it's not putting out the fire anymore. Okay. That's then disappearing effectively from our reaction. Next part of this was going through and taking it what happens when we put individual elements together. Okay? So in our first or our previous slide, we were just looking at conservation of mass. Our reaction has to be equal mass on both sides. But it didn't say anything that makes each of those things up. What we decided with our elements is that our elements make up all of our compounds. Okay? So when we go through and combine different elements to make our compounds, one of the first observations was made by Prost, and what he noticed was this law of definite composition. Okay. Meaning he could go through and say to make water, every single time it required two mass equivalents of hydrogen with one mass equivalent of oxygen. Okay. Or sorry, not mass equivalents. That there were certain percentages that came out of that, and he measured that by mass. Why would he measure it by mass? How small is an element? 
ridiculously tiny, so we can't count those. But if we get enough elements together, what happens? You get a we can get a sizable weight. So what he was able to observe is some mass ratios that came out to combine to form uh, compounds. And he knows for a particular compound, that mass ratio was always the same. Regardless of where that compound came from or who made it, the mass ratio was the same. Okay? So that's kind of a neat observation. Okay? Dalton came along and pushed this a little bit further and gave us our atomic theory. Okay? The example I like to use for the atomic theory is we can go through and take this marker and we can run a reaction of a cap and the marker. Okay? When we run that reaction, okay, we just put the cap on our Eventually, I can do it. Put the cap on the marker, right? Nice and simple. If we look at the mass ratio, there's a lot more mass in the pen than there is in the cap. Right, so if we tried to come up with some way to describe that, we looked at our mass, we're going to have a really big number on this and a really small number on this. Is there another way that we could make that observation for the reaction? How many pens to how many caps? One pen one cap. Instead of looking at mass, I can look at a count, how many there are. That counting is what we end up going through eventually, and that's really what Dalton is kind of okay. Before we step into this, how can these mass amounts even be measured? Okay, there's a couple different techniques. We can look at heat. Some compounds, when you heat them up, will decompose. So in this case, uh, potassium chloride, KClO4, when we heat that up, it'll turn into potassium chloride, just salt, and oxygen gas. We can then weigh the oxygen gas and weigh the potassium chloride to determine the mass ratio of potassium chloride to oxygen. Hydrates, so compounds that absorb water. Have we seen that before? Anybody live where someplace kind of humid and you see that they put these weird looking maggoty things in their salt? Nobody's? Yeah, what's those weird looking maggoty things? Oh. Beans or rice. I, I always panic because I thought they were maggots, but it's just, <laughs> just rice with solids in it. Why would you put rice into your salt? It absorbs the water instead of the salt. If the salt absorbs the water, what happens to that nice, fine, powdery salt? Clumps together. Okay. What if I wanted to remove that water? How could I do that? I can heat it up. So certain compounds will absorb water in particular amounts. I can measure the amount of water in an individual salt by just heating it up and looking at the mass change. Okay. Other options, we can do electrolysis which I'm working on doing that experiment for you guys in class next week, we can force electric energy into a molecule and cause it to break up into its component elements. Okay, Kind of a cool process. Combustion, we can go through. This is typically used for organic chemistry. We can take an individual compound and we can burn it. Okay, We just react it with tons of oxygen. If we know how much oxygen we put in, we can then go through different traps to isolate the results of that combustion reaction and determine what made up the initial compound or the starting compound. Does it involve a lot of math? Yeah. Well, you have to do it probably. Okay. So we've got these mass ratios, but again, that could be a bit tedious to go ahead and put together because we don't have nice round numbers. So this is where Dalton came in. We'll talk about Dalton later in the semester as well. And he came up and said that each of our compounds are made up of individual elements. Our pen was not made up of two different masses. It was made up of two different particles, the cap and the pen. Okay? He did the same thing with all molecules. Water is not made up of two different masses of hydrogen and oxygen. It's made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So what he came through and said is that we've got these small indivisible pieces Indivisible tended or turned out to be wrong, but he had these indivisible, indivisible pieces that could then be used to combine and make compounds. So it was kind of a neat theory. 
Okay. Like I said, we will go through and look at these uh, steps within his theory later in the semester, so I don't want you to stress too much on it. Okay, so we will see this exact image again. So let's take a look at some compounds and chemical formulas. Where did I put that pen down? What do these... So first off, when we look at these, almost all of them are compounds. Okay, how would we know they're compounds? More than one type of element. Okay. We have to be careful with that statement, because I like more than one, but it also has to be more than one type of element. Because if I go through and take a look at our hydrogen and oxygen down here, okay, that's the same element, but more than one. So are hydrogen and oxygen, in this bottom case, elements or compounds? They're elements. Okay, so our big difference between an element and a compound is that an element, okay, in most cases, is just one symbol, okay, just the symbol on its own. Some cases, they're diatomic, meaning we have to have two atoms to make that element. Hydrogen and oxygen are examples of that. Every other formula listed up here is a compound. Okay, and it's different from everything else because what we're going through and doing is saying that those atoms are connected to each other. How do we know they're connected to each other? When you say that statement, is it, how are they connected? Or is it, how are they connected? Okay, what are we noticing? A space. How do I know the C and the O should be said with each other? There's no space. How do I know the compound of water is hydrogen and oxygen? There is no space between those two elements when I make that compound. So we run them together as tight as we can. What other information do we see pop up in this that is slightly different than what we see with words? We know exactly how much of each element We know how many of those elements go into that formula. You'll notice that we see a two here. What's that two mean? There's two times what? Refers to the thing in front. Hydrogen. There are two hydrogens for every one oxygen in that formula. Does it say anything about mass? No. This goes back to Dalton's theory. What we're looking at is two elements. We're counting them. There are two of these pieces for every one of those. What about that next formula? How many carbons are in that structure? How many heliums? Oh, good question. Zero. Okay. Why did I not write helium with a zero next to it? Helium's not there. That zero would, while that's accurate, there are no heliums in it. I don't want to have to go through for every single compound and list 118 elements with zeros next to them. Okay? So anything that's not in our compound, we just ignore. Okay? How many oxygens? If I give you two of these molecules, how many oxygens are there? Twelve. Where would that two go in this situation? I'd put it in front. That two is now going to apply to everything that follows it. Okay. So we've got two versions of formulas now shown. What about this guy? How many hydrogens are in that one? I'll get you in a second. Why four? I see hydrogen that says three. There's another hydrogen written over there. Why on earth would we shuffle the hydrogens around like that? We're trying to show some characteristics of that molecule's reactivity. 
and what we'll learn when we talk about more complex compounds is that when you see a hydrogen in front, as far as gen chem is concerned, that compound is now reacted as an acid. Okay? How would you know that if we just written out the formula? You wouldn't. Okay? So we're trying to give you some characteristic information about the molecule as well. Okay? You'll notice the order also shuffles around. Take a look at this last compound, or second to last compound, I guess. You'll notice we've got two hydrogens again, but I didn't put the hydrogen at the front. Why not this time? Because this compound is not an acid. But why did I not just include the hydrogen with the other five? Because I want to show something about the characteristics of this molecule. That hydrogen happens to be connected to that oxygen. Okay? So our formulas are highly variable. And when you move into more advanced structures, particularly with the examples we've got up here with organic, okay, what we decide about formulas is that they are completely useless because they give us virtually no information about the structure of the molecule, which means we have no understanding of its reactivity. So realize, when you go through and look at individual compounds, sometimes the formula is helpful, sometimes it's not. Okay? But the basic interpretation is always there. Right. Now questions. Yes, there you have. Which may go back away. It's okay. Um, on that second one we talked about, why not just put like one instead of six since they're all the same number? Interesting question. Why not put a one? So what you're asking is why is this not C1, H1, O1? Or, yeah, pretty much. Or we wouldn't even need the one, right? Okay. I agree with that too. We don't even need the one. Why not just write CHO? It's an interesting question. What you've just discovered here is what's known as an empirical formula versus the molecular formula. What's the difference between an empirical formula and a molecular form formula? A molecular formula represents what the molecule has in it. This molecule, which happens to be sugar, has six carbons six hydrogens, and six oxygens. The empirical formula looks at the lowest possible ratio, but it doesn't give you the exact atoms that are found within the compound. So we've already kind of heard my disdain for the molecular formula. Guess how much I like the empirical formula. Okay, the empirical formula takes even more information and removes it all. Okay, again, do we need the empirical formula? Certain experiments, yes. Okay, we can use that to try and determine a molecular formula, which again, well, you'll probably see that in 151 if you continue to take gen chem. What happens with that last experiment? Or now we've got a slightly different format. We're not looking at just a formula. We're looking at a reaction. We're taking hydrogen and oxygen, and we're going to react them to make water. Okay? So our formulas for our hydrogen and oxygen, we need to actually use those as formulas because we have two hydrogen atoms per a molecule of hydrogen, per a molecule of the element of hydrogen. Okay? So we need to bring those twos in. When we move over to the formula for water, you'll notice the 2 is also there. Why is the 2 present for water, but not present for oxygen? The 2 in front of the hydrogen in our starting material, okay, over here, is different from the 2 in water. They mean entirely two different things. Okay? Our red hydrogen, or our red 2 if we want, represents the amount of hydrogen atoms in a molecule of hydrogen gas. The blue 2 is the amount of hydrogens present in a molecule of water. They mean different things, even though the symbol's the same. Okay? Again, as we start to pick up steam, we'll start to see these patterns show up. We're just trying to address them at this point so you get a better feel for when they show up. Okay? 
more questions on our compounds and chemical formulas. Least favorite topic. We're done at 40. Least favorite topic, in my opinion, particularly to address now. We've had officially one day, well, not even really one day of chemistry. Okay? And we're now going to get into this concept of physical and chemical properties, okay? or physical and chemical changes in a second. These are very difficult to nail down because depending on what you actually understand of the chemical process, which is looking at how the atoms change their locations and they change their bonds, can we decide if it's a physical or chemical property? Right? Which makes this interesting. Have we talked about bonds yet? How many of you know what a bond is? Okay. Maybe half the class. It's a bit sketchy to start talking about these physical versus chemical properties when we don't, can't even wrap our heads around what makes each of these. Okay? Our physical properties are observable characteristics that do not alter the elemental composition. Okay? For instance, if I take ice and I heat it up, what happens? It melts and it turns into water. What's the formula for ice? H2O. What's the formula for water? H2O. All I've done is given an individual water molecule more energy to move. Okay? I haven't changed the chemical composition. Okay? So as long as the chemical composition doesn't change, we're looking at a physical change or a physical property. The big classic one that shows up are your phase transitions. Okay? Physical observations, color, okay, density, solubility, conductivity. Pretty much every single one of those can change with temperature. Okay. Those changes are physical changes. Okay. As long as we don't change the composition of the compound, we're in a physical property. Okay. Chemical property... Well, chemical property, we're going to change the composition. Okay? So, for instance, I could take water, and instead of looking at H2O, I now turn it into H and OH, okay? with a space between them. Isn't that a song, space between them? No. Okay. I have now done a chemical change. I have changed water into hydrogen and OH, or a hydrogen atom, in OH. That's now a chemical change because I've broken the connection between those. Tricky because we don't even know what the connection is. Okay. So, typical things that we could look at as evidence for a chemical change. So we've got a couple examples down here. What observables might suggest a chemical change? And all of those pictures are examples of chemical changes. Define reaction. What are you observing for that reaction? What happened in this case? There's no hot plate, so I'm not heating this sample, and yet what does it look like it's doing? Mm, I would take it a step further than dissolving. It actually looks like it's boiling. Okay? There's a little piece of metal in the bottom of this glass that's actually giving off this gas. Okay? So the formation of a gas is evidence for a chemical change. Is that always true? Boiling your pot of pasta, your boiling pasta. You take a pot of water, you boil the pot of water, what happens to the liquid water? It turns it to a gas. Well, that was a phase change. I saw the formation of a gas, but is that a chemical change? No, that's a physical change. Okay. How do we know it's a physical change? We added more energy into it. We added heat. In the case of this gas formation, there is no hot plate. All we did was mix two compounds together, boom, gas. Okay. So as long as all we're doing is mixing two things and not supplying anything else, we're looking at a chemical change when we see these differences pop up. Okay. For that next example, it's actually pretty much the same thing, just with a more reactive metal. Okay. It's giving off sparks and fire. Sparks, wherever there's fire, there's... Actually, wherever there's smoke, but wherever there's fire, there's... Don't tell me smoke. 
heat. Heat. Okay. A release of heat by the reaction is a form of chemical change. Or the absorption of heat. So if you touch something and it's increasingly getting cold, it's a chemical change. It's absorbing heat from your hand. So a change in heat or a change in temperature is an example of a chemical change. What's happening in that last one? We're seeing a color change. Okay, kind of, sort of. We're taking a clear yellow liquid and a clear white liquid, just a clear colorless liquid, and we mix them, and we've now got this yellow powder forming in the middle of that, or a yellow solid. Okay, so we've got a phase change. And we kind of have a color change, too. Okay? So the formation of a new phase is also a chemical change. But again, we have to be careful. If we're adding or removing heat, yes, we'll see a phase change. Okay? But that was us contributing to that, forcing the physical change. Okay? Perfectly understandable, right? Clear as mud. Okay? So what we're looking at as possible chemical changes, we've got a gas, change in temperature, phase changes, and a permanent color change. Okay? Those are all examples of chemical changes. So with our last slide, which works out pretty nicely, let's take a look at these inside. Is it a chemical or a physical change? Okay, so we've got four phrases, I guess, up top, a fifth phrase at the bottom, and then we've got a picture running through the middle. Okay, and trying to decide what's happening in each of these cases, be it chemical or physical. You guys want to work on it a little bit by yourself first before we talk about it, or go right into it? Kind of heard to go right into it, and everybody's staring at me, so I think I should keep talking. Okay, let's take a look at melting water. It's a physical change. To cause that melting process, we have to add heat. Okay, I guess I should have said melting ice. But what if I just take a block of ice and set it on the table? I'm not heating it, and yet what's going to happen to it? It's going to melt. Am I actually heating it? No. Yeah. I'm taking it from an environment at one temperature, and I'm putting it into an environment of a different temperature. That temperature change is all I'm supplying. And when it comes to ice, that's really easy to do. We just take it out of the freezer. Okay. So melting water. Sorry, I can't say that again. Melting ice okay, is a physical change. How about dissolving sugar? All right, let's make it even more tricky. Dissolving sugar, now let's add in the next one. Dissolving salt. both cases, you're effectively taking a white solid, you put it into the liquid, still in there. Okay. Homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures? Homogeneous, because they're evenly going to dissolve between it. Dissolving sugar is an example of physical. Okay. Well, if we dissolve one white solid, Dissolving salt is chemical. chemical. What? Why? Because we are making a homogeneous. Both of them are homogeneous mixtures. But both of them are. Uh, we will. I'm not sure. I even want to get into that process of that, actually. Dissolving sugar, the formula for sugar is C6H6O6. When you dissolve it into water, it's still C6H6O6. When we dissolve salt, it's NaCl as a solid. As soon as we hit it into water, it's not NaCl anymore. It's sodium ion and chloride ion. The bond between the sodium and the chloride is broken when you dissolve salt. Where is the dissolving salt on this chemical versus physical thing? It's a really weird gray area. And that's because when we look at physical versus chemical, it's not these are all physical, these are all chemical. It's a spectrum, just like a rainbow. Okay? 
we're moving from red to purple, or chemical to physical. And anywhere within that slide, we have arbitrarily said green is the definitive. Everything to the left of green is red. Everything to the right of green is purple. Okay, is that true? No, we've got oranges and yellows and blues and violets. And we've got all those other colors showing, showing up in the spectrum. Physical and chemical are in that same kind of idea. How are we going to know more about this? Well, when we understand something about the formulas and what's physically happening to each of those molecules, that's when you can decide physical versus chemical. At this stage in the game, I don't expect you to know as much about it. So would the salt, the garden salt, be a new phase? Is that what it would be? No, I wouldn't call that. Uh, both of them are technically a new phase because they're solutions. Okay, go ahead and pack up. I'll give you the answers on the rest of these. Burning wood is a chemical. If we take a look at the pictures, we're looking at a color change going from yellow to purple. Very interesting molecule. The molecule absorbs light, changes its structure, which then changes how it interacts with light. We see a color change. That is actually a chemical change. However, adding red food dye into white cake frosting, chemical or physical? That's physical. I'm not changing the chemical compositions. All I am doing is mixing those two species. Okay, right, you're good to go. Absolutely.